there is, of course, uh, I, there, there's a certain uh, restriction on what you can do with film clips, which I think people ought to know before um, we, you know, we can we continue, because, you know, uh, as you'll notice, Mark does talk quite a lot during this film, <laughs> um, and there's a reason for that, which you, you should explain, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, when you're using film clips in the way that we use them, you know, it as broadly as a scholar uses them, i.e., uh, uh, if there's a particular law called fair use, fair dealing, then you are not allowed to distort the clip, you're not allowed to speed it up, you're, you're not allowed to mess around with it. But nor would we have wanted to, in fact, on the contrary, you know, you've noticed that all the ratios are respected, etc., which isn't always the ca case. So it was very, very important to make sure that we didn't mess around with the film clips. Um, yeah. And the, 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 the way that you have to, you're, you're allowed to use these clips is called critique, critique and review. So you, you have to be using a film clip that only that clip can illustrate the point. You can't use it in a wallpaper sense. And you have to be uh, analyzing it in its form or its content. And um, as I hinted beforehand, you, know, you very passionately hate it when people refer to this as a series. Or, or even, even though it, obviously the first experience people had in the UK was it as a TV series, but you feel that it's very definitely that the whole work is one long film. And I, you know, I've seen people queuing to see the entire thing. Um, uh, well, what's your defence of this? <laughs> well, it's, it, it makes me sound a bit snobby. I love TV and I watch much more TV than nearly anybody I know, especially people who make TV. So I, I love it. But um, it, for me, it was I wanted to use a, a, a cinema style broadly for this. And the crucial thing was the screen direction. When you're watching TV, often there's somebody on screen looking at you, whereas this, I don't know if you felt this in the audience tonight or when, when you're watching on TV, but I am going to have to turn my microphone. I felt I needed to be sitting this way, looking at the screen that way, as if I'm sitting in the audience. Um, when we're all watching, we're all in the same direction, and I'm trying to move your eye around the screen the screen, as it were, so that screen direction, I feel that's a more cinematic direction than that direction in some way. That was the first thing. And then other things, there are certain aspects of TV aesthetics, you could call them slot aesthetics, you know, where you have to summarize things a lot, yeah. which we didn't do. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, you have to Believe. cut quite fast, which we didn't do. In some way, you could say the pacing is quite slow. You know, when people are, there aren't many interviews in this, there are only, I think 40 interviews in 15 hours, which is relatively few, you know. So, I, I, as I say, I love TV. I love the democratic process of TV. I fell in love with cinema because of TV. Um, but I didn't want to borrow the form of TV. I wanted to try and do something else than that. Uh, I was kind of fascinated because, I, I mean, I've, I've seen this uh, in many incarnations. I saw a, a, a shorter version of it here about nine months ago. And then I saw you doing it in Telluride, which was an oh, yes. extraordinary different setup altogether. Um, but I'm, I was intrigued by you know, what, what, what the worst moments were during the production, because uh, I never got to hear that. Uh, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of great moments. And you know, the, one of the things about, I don't know if you're like this, but worst moments, you sort of wipe them from your memory because they're not very nice. Well, we, we noticed this earlier because you know, he, he couldn't remember any, and, and Jill, Jill, his partner, my, had to remind him. Yeah, of my those. partner reminded me of, of a moment that was particularly bad. And in the, in the booklet that goes along with the DVD of this film, I've written a good 20,000 words, a, a rather longer booklet than you would expect. And I write about one moment in particular. We were in Sydney, Australia. We were going to interview Jane Campion, and I was going to talk about one of the great films, Angel at My Table. And there's one scene in it where Kerry Fox, who I think is here this evening, is holding a piece of chalk to um, uh, a blackboard and she has something happen. She's terrified. She's terrified to turn around. And I think I was exhausted. John, I'll remember this, but I was so exhausted with the shooting. And we'd added more interviews in. Uh, to, to an already busy schedule. And I get so panicked when, before interviewing someone. The reason is I don't want to interview someone unless I've seen all their films. So when I interviewed Jack Lemmon, I'd seen all hundred and whatever of his films. Where I, you know, I just have to. For me, it's a matter of professional pride. And we were adding more and more stuff on. And I stayed up that night before the interview with Jane Campion. And I remember I couldn't get to sleep and I was 
I was crying and, and it was just the overload of filmmaking. It's as simple as that and all filmmakers know this and any, it's not really filmmakers, anybody who's got a job that has got any stress. And then we went along to James Campion who of course was totally adorable and wonderful and relaxed and happy and I asked her about that scene where Kerry Fox has the chalk and she says she has a panic attack and I thought, that's what happened to me last night. I hadn't even thought of that phrase, and that's what it was. And that's a sort of personal answer to your question, and there could be you know, more robust answers, but yeah. I think that when you're making something where you feel very exposed, and you know you're doing something that everybody's going to see, and dare I say it, that Sight and Sound will write a review about it, yeah. you know, and... I d- it didn't, occur to, next question, really, didn't occur to me for a minute that we would I would find myself on the stage of, of the, the NFT VFI at all, so that's unexpected. But nonetheless, when you know that that degree of exposure, it, it affects your nervous system in some way. Yeah, I mean, I think this leads into another thing that we were just discussing, which is the anxiety of somebody who is known as a critic, uh, making a, a critical film about cinema, mm-hmm. and the sort of feeling that, oh my God, you know, the, the business of taking the risk of putting yourself out there, <laughs> uh, especially when you're actually trying to, you know, encompass everything. I mean, it's a, it, it, I haven't had the guts to do it, um, but you, <laughs> you can. But, um, <laughs> well, you, well, you can't hide, you know, this is, this is not only, you know, it's not a, it's 15 hours and it's international and it's been showing all around the world. I'm just back from Beijing and Hong Kong and I was, I was saying to Nick earlier that, you know, that when you're making something like this, if you've read at all, if you care at all, you know on whose shoulders you're standing, you know on which critics you're standing. I remember thinking, oh, how do I look at Charlie Chaplin, you know, with, with, the, with the knowledge of what David Robinson writes about? How do I look at Asian cinema, knowing what Tony Raines has done in Asian cinema? How do I, how do I look about third cinema, knowing what... Um, Paul Willimon has done, you know, and you sort of, it's very easy to get just terrified and say, well, I'll wait my turn. I'll wait until they have all written their history of cinema or made their history of cinema before I make mine. And then you think, well, I might as well. What's the worst that can happen? You know, you can get a bucket of shit, critical shit on your head. That's about as bad as it can get. But do you have any sort of perspective yet on how effective you think this film is as an educational tool? Yes, um, very. I, I know it sounds, it sounds um, uh, uh, very immodest, and it is very immodest, but I've just travelled so much with it recently, you know, and uh, I've been all over America and many bits of Asia and in, in many places, Museum of Modern Art, and, and I think probably I've had at least 30 university professors asking if they can, A, incorporate it into their course, and B, if I could teach on that course as well, which is very nice. And um, so I would add to my immodesty the, f- the following huge, huge um, disclaimer, which is the fact that it's good because the films are good. And what it, it's the best way to, to think of it is a kind of tasting menu. You know, I didn't make the food, but I've served it up, you know, and I've served it up with some degree of thought, shall we say, you know, but it's a tasting menu and I, I think that's how it works. And so I've had so many Facebook messages from people saying, I didn't even know that there were African sci-fi movies or, you know, I've never heard of Sotujit Ray or I've just, it's a constant stream of that. And that is satisfying in itself. 